Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good lunch. We're just getting organized. Thank you for being here, and I want to thank all the speakers that are here today. And um, I, we're going to do a little change from the agenda, which, first of all, this session is about this slide, which is the more we know about Titan, we know that there's more to learn, essentially. And um, we're, um, I think, Dr. Um, one of the doctors mentioned this morning that we're pioneers, and so I appreciate you being on our pioneering journey together. It's, it can be frustrating, but we're here to have some of the researchers talk to us to have them answer some of the questions. The way that it was on the agenda is that we had two half-hour slots with different researchers speaking, but they're all here, and so we thought we'd just have each of them talk a little bit about their research, and then we're going to segue that into kind of goals for Teen Titan and research goals for each of them. For, and I had got some input from family members, what they'd like to see in the direction of our team, and just have kind of a discussion in that manner. And then that this session will wrap up at 2.45 with a break, and then they're going to have the plenary sessions after which are going to focus on nutrition and orthopedics. So that's sort of a summary. So um, that was a little change in the agenda from having like two different segments to kind of being together. And then we can all kind of talk about research goals, but also larger goals for, for families as well. So um, with that, I think the first, should I turn it over to John? Did you want to talk? And then we'll also just have a Q&A about research. So. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is John Smith. I do research at the University of Arizona on our lab studies Titan and Nebulin, the two largest proteins. And um, we use a lot of mouse models to try to understand better what Titan does in the muscles. And we've also tried um, introducing clinical mutations um, into the mouse to see if we could uh, mimic the symptoms the patients have so we could get to the point of trying therapies and so far with the, the mouse models, they, they haven't worked that well. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's where we are. Uh, but we also get uh, clinical samples from some of our collaborators, and <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and uh, we can uh, analyze the protein, which requires specialized techniques, and do Western blots, which help us figure out um, if there's a smaller than expected Titan, what parts are there and not there, um, to understand how that might be a problem. And I think I'll just pass this along. We can all introduce ourselves and then open the questions. Okay, so my name is Isabel Richard. I'm from France. Um, I work in an institute created by the French Association Against Myopathy. And um, um, most of my research is focusing on the muscular dystrophies. I, uh, over the year, I uh, initially I was very interested in genetic, and over the year I was moving more and more in gene therapy, and now I am really um, preparing some clinical trial, not for Titan yet. I will see that in the discussion that we have a lot of uh, uh, things to solve and to understand on Titan, um, but. Um, um, so my involvement in Titan was in fact the discovery of a mutation in a group of family coming from Finland um, and um, uh, this was a collaboration with Björn uh, in Finland and uh, I will just stop by an anecdote because um, we wanted to, uh, this was a very big family, and we wanted uh, to identify the gene. And uh, we, we, we knew already that Titan was a very a good candidate because it was really lo uh, located at the place where we, we knew that the gene in this family was. So we said, okay, we're going to um, sequence all the gene, uh, all the uh, 363 exons. And we decided to start by the beginning. And so um, <laughs> we should have beginning by the end because we found the mutation in the last exon. <laughs> 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 and uh, another story regarding this discovery was that uh, the technician that did most of the work until I think the last four or three exons. Uh, just at the end, in fact, um, she went in uh, maternity leave 
So she was not the one that made the discovery. Also, she has done 95 percent of the of the work. Uh, yeah, that was the first story of my discovery of Titan, and. Um, we have participated in the identification of additional mutation uh, on Titan uh, in other uh, in different forms of uh, muscular dystrophy or uh, forms that have cardiac aspect plus muscle aspect, and um, we also are quite interested uh, in Titan because this protein is interacting with another. Or it, it's interacting with a lot of proteins, but it's interacting with another protein um, uh, which is responsible for another muscular dystrophy, which is called CAMP3. And we made a discovery of the, of the uh, um, application of CAMP3 also in the lab. And uh, so we have been studying the interaction between these two proteins using different animal models. And now, um, uh, because our lab now is focused more on developing a therapeutic strategy, we are um, uh, moving into uh, different techniques for um, uh, manipulating Titan and trying to uh, uh, develop uh, therapeutic tools, um, or mostly initially using um, cells from patients that we can factor is a technique uh, where you can uh, draw some blood, isolate the, the white cells from this blood and, and derive um, um, muscle cells by redirecting, going back, in fact, the, the, uh, um, has a naive cells, in sort of, uh, kind of, and you, you're going back in the time and you put them again in um, um, because they are white cells of the blood, so you put them in kind of, uh, um, can I say that, uh, non-specific cells, and we call that stem cells, and then we redirect them toward the muscles. So we can do, do that and, uh, and uh, then uh, modify these cells uh, and try to develop tools for correcting mutations. What can I say for now? So we are here for answering uh, all your questions. Uh, we have put some slides that mostly are supporting the uh, your, for supporting your question uh, or answers to your questions. Um, yeah, maybe I forgot things, but uh, we will come back. I will leave the mic to. Hi, um, my name is Emily Troiano. I'm, um, I work with Dr. Alan Beggs at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, I'm his lab manager, which uh, basically means I do a little bit of everything in the lab, so I'm like kind of a jack of all trades, but master of none is how I kind of describe it. Um, so one of my um, specializations in the lab, I guess, is uh, working with animal models. So uh, we have mouse and zebrafish models of several different genes in our lab. Um, uh, for, for Titan, we have a, a zebrafish model that we're working with. So, um, and one of the things we're doing with zebrafish in our lab is um, uh, drug screening. So we have um, plates with like 48 little wells, and so we can put individual fish in the wells and um, try different drugs on them and see if the fish move more or less than they would without the drug. So um, that's my kind of background. And, and I, 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 I'm Jeff Ledrick, and I also uh, work with Alan and, and Emily, and my area is, is muscle, muscle physiology, and I've also done some work with human muscle uh, fibers and, and, and mouse muscle. But because of the interest in zebrafish in the Banks lab, and also I work with Luke Kunkel, and who's, uh, who studies muscular dystrophies, and there's interest in his lab with um, dystrophin deficient zebrafish. Because of those interests, I've, I've tried to take some of the techniques that we use on mu mu mouse muscles and translate, transfer them to studying zebrafish. So, um, and, and, and so I'll have, I, can, I have some slides if you want to see them, yeah. we can talk about it, about how. How that how that works and how we might use that in, in, in drug screening, as Emily mentioned, to try to find molecules that um, uh, 
that actually have a beneficial effect on muscle function of, 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 a, of a zebra fish model we have that's, that lacks type. Sure. Can you show me that? Yeah. Sure. Oh, I think right. that was our introduction. That was our introduction. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. I talked this morning. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm uh, interested in type from a clinical point of view, and I think we talked a little bit about some of the clinical findings that, um, yeah. that we've made, made by um, collaborating and combining forces and looking at a whole lot of patients with uh, diagnostically confirmed congenital type of um, And within that first paper, we actually had some some Western blot data from this team. Um, and, but I'm also really interested in using uh, next generation sequencing technologies like something called RNA-seq, which you might hear a little bit about um, uh, in, over the next two days, and I'm happy to talk about what that means. Just to delve into what's really happening within the muscle as a result of the, the mutations that we're seeing yeah. in patients. And also seeing whether or not that information can help us predict who's going to be more severely affected by this condition. And I should also note there's a couple of different type of things, and sometimes that's really confusing for families to understand. So there's a, a couple of dominant conditions, so that means that you just need one change in one of your copies of the type of gene um, that's pathogenic. Um, and the classical uh, dominant condition is the condition that Isabel was, was talking about. She helped find the very first um, mutation in something called tibial muscular dystrophy, which is an adult onset disorder. And that was the very first type of we described, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. And then there's another condition called, that's a really long name, HBIRF is what we all refer to it as, but it's hereditary myopathy with early respiratory failure, and that's a dominant disorder as well. And that's a really unusual disorder. It needs just one change in one particular exon, 344, to cause this condition. It's a really odd one we don't really understand. Uh, type mutations are the most common core, genetic cause of adult onset dilated cardiomyopathy, and we talked about that in the last session quite a bit. And that's of particular interest to families who are segregating for truncated mutations. And then there's a series of recessive disorders. So these are disorders that usually cause muscle weakness and possibly, or frequently, also cardiac um, abnormalities. Um, and you need two changes within both copies of the type gene to get these disorders. And in general, in contrast to the dominant disorders, they're early onset. So they're normally congenital, so the congenital type of these either born with or develop in the first year of life, or they develop, there's some recessive type of things that develop during childhood and adolescence, but almost all of them manifest before adulthood. So it's a bit confusing, I think, for families to kind of get your head around those sort of differences. Um, so there are a whole lot of different type of things, and we've got specialisation along here in all, all sorts of, all, all five types, all, all major types of the type of things. I thought I'd just say that. Thanks. Um, why don't you go ahead and load up uh, your slides to show what the zebra fish look like? And does anyone want to start with a question now? <laughs> One of the common questions is that um, you just this isn't such about research, but it's a general question about Titan, which is that there's a spectrum of disorders. From congenital myopathies or my, myopathic changes to dystrophies, like you're explaining, and some of the questions that came up on our Facebook group is people were asking, well, um, how do you distinguish between whether you call it a myopathy or a dystrophy? And if you have a dystrophy, is that a more severe phenotype than if you're just considered a myopathy? And then we can um, move on to his slides. I, I can I can probably answer that, and Isabel can probably answer that as well. So. Um, so tightenopathy, congenital tightenopathy, so the recessive tightenopathies are generally considered myopathies, not dystrophies. Uh, and that's because um, in the muscle, in some cases, a little bit of re what we call regeneration, degeneration, so there's a little bit of turnover of the muscle fibres, but there's not a lot of it. Whereas the classic hallmark feature of a dystrophy is that the muscle is actively, um, sections of the muscle are actively dying and regenerating continuously over time. And in general, dystrophies are much more progressive than a myopathy. So myopathy, in some ways, people think about it that the, you're born with the muscle not having developed in the right way, but the pathology is already there and it's relatively static, so it doesn't change so much over time. The differences we see clinically are often because children grow, and so as they grow, their muscles weak, the muscles find it harder and harder to do the jobs that, that, that they're designed to do just because they're inherently not quite built in the right way, if that makes sense. 
whereas in dystrophies, they tend to progress over the time because the muscle is actually actively struggling to survive on a continual basis. So classically speaking, a myopathy is something where the muscle biopsy shows no change in terms of active dying and regeneration, or only a little bit. Titanopathy is a little bit unusual in that it shows a little bit as a fairly frequent thing, but it's not the dominant feature. And so that's, that's in general, the difference between a myopathy and a dystrophy. Is titan muscular dystrophy sort of a misnomer, or a, not quite using the semantics? So, um, so tibial muscular dystrophy, oh gosh, I have to, I have to re refresh my memory about what the muscle shows there. I think initially, uh, yeah, that actually, uh, so Isabel probably knows more about that disorder than I do. So I think in initially, so that's actually a, a slowly progressive condition. So it normally starts to manifest in adulthood, and it tends to slowly progress Isn't over time. No. The TMD are usually a late onset. Um, but in fact, this, this particular mutation, which is a dominant uh, uh, presentation, when you have this, when you have, maybe the, I don't know the level of people here, but when you have, you can, this can lead officially if you have two copies of the gene that have the same mutation, it can lead to another form which is much more severe, but uh, which is a really muscular dystrophy. Uh, but the mechanism, uh, of the disease is not totally uh, no. That um, no, it's a muscular dystrophy. I'm, I'm, it's a muscular dystrophy in the TMT so, as well. So, yeah. I think on biopsy in tibial muscular dystrophy, that dominant disorder, there is actually active loss of fibers and regeneration of fibers, and so that does look much more, more like a classic dystrophy than the congenital tightenopathy, for example. Um, and there is progression over time as a result of active uh, muscle loss and regeneration. So hopefully that makes sense. Oh. Um, so, so, probably, yeah. oh. so, so I'm, I'm sure you're all aware that probably the, the workhorse in the lab is a mouse. Um, but you may not be aware that um, there's been a big push towards zebrafish. And you can see a zebrafish in your in your in your pet store, you can, you can find zebrafish. But what, what we tend to study with, with a lot of these myopathies are, are, are the very young zebrafish. They're only two or three days old. They're a couple millimeters long. And one of the reasons we like to use zebrafish are because we can take a, a male and female zebrafish, and in the morning we have uh, 200 fertilized <laughs> eggs. And in a, in a day or two we can start studying those larvae. They hatch in a day or two. They start swimming around. Their muscles completely formed by about 24 hours. So, so it allows us to do experiments much faster than we could if we did mice, where we might have to wait, have to wait 30 to 90 days to, for, for the mice to, to develop. So, so zebrafish have, have, have a lot of advantages. Another advantage is cost. So in our institution, it's a, 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 a over, a dollar, a, over a dollar a day to, to take care of a mouse, one mouse. A fish is less than a penny a day. So, so your research dollar goes farther than the zebrafish. No, they're not going to replace mice, but they, but they can answer questions. I think they can, they can, can move the field forward. And so, I just wanted to illustrate. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a website called ZFIN, um, and it, it, it's a, it has, it's a repository of lots of information on zebrafish, and, and they have articles um, about uh, that have been published uh, in, on zebrafish. Now, not all of these articles are on muscle. In this first, first example. Uh, they can be across all sorts of diseases. There's there's different fields like toxicology uses a lot of zebrafish to look at uh, chemicals and pollutants and how they affect organisms. But you can see since about the mid 1990s, there's been this exponential increase in the number of articles with zebrafish in the title. And in 1996, one of the things that helped that accelerate were 37 papers that were published all together in one journal that were that dealt with. Um, Mutations to the zebrafish and, and the and the resultant phenotypes. And one of those papers had 166 mobility mutants. And out of those 166 mobility mutants, where the fish didn't swim correctly, they identified four that looked like dystrophies or, or, or myopathies. And one of those fish is, was called Runzel, and that's the fish I'm going to talk about today. And it, it's a fish that doesn't have a type. Okay. So it's a fish that we can use in our drug screens. We can treat this fish. 
and we can look at our assays to see if it makes improvements in, in what we measure in our assays, and that could lead us to uh, a drug that may be in use uh, for, for patients. And then on the right, on the right, I just uh, went into the ZFIT database and I just used keywords like muscle, muscular dystrophy, my, my, uh, myopathy, and, and, and so there's not as many people in the field of muscle who are using zebra fish. As you can see, since the two, in the last um, 20 years or so, there's kind of this exponential increase in the number of papers that are focused on muscle that kind of kind of mimics the, 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 the field in general. So um, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that's nice about zebra fish is these, these, these very young, three or four day old zebra fish, they're transparent. So, so we can see right through and we can see the muscle. And we can use various optical techniques. And on, on the top uh, left is is, is 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 the muscle, the tail part of a zebra fish. That's a normal, it's a wild type, an un or an unaffected zebra fish, not affected. And the one on the bottom is 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 this zebra fish, this Runzel, that has no type. And you can see see just visually on, on the screen here uh, the, the difference in those two fish. And so we can identify these fish at about four at about three or four days. And we don't, have, we don't have to sacrifice them to identify them. We can just lightly anesthetize and look at this, then, then they recover from the anesthesia. And we can, we can, we've separated them out into those that are affected and those that are non affected, and then we can do our, our studies on those fish. Um, and so, one of the things. Can I jump in and clarify? Just, sure. You said they have no type, but actually, they don't have skeletal muscle type. So That's right. Wild fish have two types, two copies. So, excellent point. Yeah. Well, okay. We just know it's that's, that's right. That's right. <laughs> this is, yeah, that's right. So this is no skeletal muscle complaint. So they don't have. They still have cardiac cardiac. So so. Uh, so so we so as Emily said, we, we, we have these plates with with wells in, and you can get them up to you can get them up to three hundred and some wells in a plate. We haven't used the forty eight well plates because we want to give them a little bit more room to swim in. And so here in the, in the top, uh, I have alternated rows. The top row would have would have non-affected and then affected fish, non-affected. So I so I've uh, put them in these in these wells, and we put them in a in a, a machine which is essentially just a uh, a light tight box with a camera on the top. But the camera uh, works with infrared um, illum uh, in infrared illumination, and so we can track how these zebra fish move in light or dark. And this is actually in the light and the little red traces is, is, is how much the zebra fish move in 10 minutes. Okay, then we turn off the lights. So here, so here they are in the light. When we turn off the lights, you can see, and I don't even have to point it out, that the, the, the non-affected fish moved a lot more than the runs of fish. Okay? So then what we we take this data and we can kind of plot it out. And so here, so here's here's our here's our two fish in the light. And then here, here are two fish in the dark, and you can kind of see a clear separation between the unaffected, the, the non-affected fish, and the fish that are our type of mutant fish. So, so we want to, so, 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 so we're working on how to, how to analyze that data a little more and how to use that. So, so the idea here would be that we could set up this plate, and we could treat some of the, some of, some of the uh, mutant fish with a drug, and come down here. Here, here would be the untreated ones, but if we could shift these guys up to here so that they're moving more, that might be an effective drug. Right? So, and, and because this is relatively quick, we can go through many, many drugs. Not uh, there was a talk. There's been a talk. There was a talk uh, yesterday. You know, they, they've looked at 100,000 drugs. We're, we're not quite up to, to that speed, but we can do we can do hundreds up to you know thousand drugs with this you know relatively in, in a few in a few in a few months versus. You know, we, you can never do that with mice. Yeah. Just to clarify, these are FDA-approved drugs that are being repurposed, or these are what what we're a lot of people start with the FDA-approved drugs. So so you can start with drugs that, um, for, for for instance, the other people I work with, uh, the Kunkel Lab, um, did this with dystrophic fish. So they found a drug that's used for asthma. It's used to treat asthma. It was it, or I'm sorry, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It was a, it was kind of the top drug in the 80s, which it, now it's kind of a third tier drug. It actually helps these dystrophic fish, and and so so 
So we're not looking for, we don't look at drugs that we think are going to affect muscle, we just look at all of these drugs. These, you can also get library, if you have an idea, if you want to look at the antioxidant, there are antioxidant libraries that contain you know, hundreds of antioxidants. There are natural compound libraries. Tamoxifil, we, we, there's been a little talk about tamoxifil. Tamoxifil is a natural, um, it's a natural compound. So, so, so there's lots of different libraries you can use, but most people start with FDA-approved drugs because then if you get a hit, if you get one, you, you can get it into a clinical trial probably much quicker because the pharmacologic, all of the pharmacological properties and the to tox toxicity of that drug have already been worked out. So, you're, so you're, you're using all of that information. It took 20, 10 or 20 years to develop that drug. You're skipping over all of that because you already have that. Yeah. That's a big question. Sure. Um, there should be a wireless mic somewhere too. There's, 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 they both have wires. Oh, no, there there should be a, there should be a third one that it's just have a wire on it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. Hello. Oh, yeah. So uh, if uh, the zebrafish has only cardiac ice form, cardiac titan, so why are you using the swimming acid? Zebrafish to judge your we, we, use, we use this swimming at so it's in they have no titan in skeletal muscle, right? Well, they probably have a little, maybe probably other copies. Okay. They, they swim, swim. They, they swim. Yeah, you're right. There must be something. The, 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 there is a problem with this fish, and no one's been able to find a mutation, partly because titan is, is, so, is so large. <laughs> There's also been there all, in evolution, there was a gene duplication event. So, so zebrafish have two copies of a lot of genes. That, that's a problem with using zebrafish. If you're not going to one gene, there may be a, a copy. But these fish, um, the mutation is in an area where titan is the only muscle protein in that part of the genome. And, um, oh, I believe there's something wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, and I believe yeah. if you find anything that helps the fish, grow. yeah. 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 So, 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 so we have, so we have, we have at least low levels of titan here, and and the fish, and you would expect the fish aren't going to move as well, so they don't move as well. Can we, can we do something to help them move better? Yeah. Can we treat them some way with a drug? And this kind of gets to your question too. So you could say, well, there might be a lot of things that influence how a fish swims. Um, uh, it's, it's a neuromuscular activity, right? So there's the muscle, there's a neural system as well as a muscle system. So, so what we also can do is we can take we can take one of these fish and we can attach it between a force transducer and some other equipment, and and it's in a it's in a little it's in a little buffer, so so it stays so the actual muscle uh, is remains viable. And I don't have it illustrated here, but there's two electrodes that lie um, beside that, and by sending current through those electrodes, we can get that muscle to contract. So here I can measure the force that that muscle produces. This is a whole fish. I, it's a fish. Uh, it's the tail part of the fish. Okay, and the tail is mostly muscle. There's a nodal cord that goes down, but it's mostly muscle. And then, in essence, they're doing single muscle fiber. Well, yeah, it, it's it, it's similar to doing a single muscle fiber, but it's a, it's a, it's really a muscle. And it's, a, it's, 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 it's more than one fiber. There's many, many fibers that are arranged in myotomes to form this mm -hmm. tail yeah. section. And, and so, so there, there's, there's the unaffected fish. Here's, here's the runzel fish. So you can oh. see how much less force they produce, which is pretty similar to how, you know, seems to be uh, very similar to how they swim. So, so the way, I guess, the, the big picture here is how, how, do we, how do we go from this drug library, we have, to have thousands of drugs, how do we find, out, out of a thousand drugs, how do we find maybe two or three that, that really affect muscle function? And, and so our, our idea is, is, that, is that we would, we would use this swimming assay because it's very quick, very fast, and that's gonna eliminate hundreds and hundreds of drugs, so, so they're eliminated. We, 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 we think we'll find some Drugs that are potential therapeutics that help the fish swim better, but there could be a lot of things that influence swimming. And so then those, there will only be a few of those, and this is much, much slower, but because we only have a few to study, it won't slow us down that much, and then we'll be able to actually measure whether those, those potential therapeutics actually are therapeutic to the muscle. And then if they are, then those would be 
that, that would go to the next step, you know, testing in mice or perhaps even into clinical trials if they're an FDA approved drug. So, so that's kind of what, we, what we've been working on with the zebrafish and, and the drug streams. So we've talked about we've talked about a couple of different animal models, just because the cord is not that long. So uh, definitely um, mice and also rats, I think, have been studied quite extensively from a Titan point of view, particularly by the Gramsia lab. Zebrafish are amazing, except that they're quite a tricky model because there's, unlike in humans, there's two copies of Titan. Uh, zebrafish have four. So it's actually a really tricky model in some ways. And I think that's added to the complexity of finding the right fish. But, it's great that we've got a test study of fish now. We're also trying to do fruit fly studies in Sydney. Um, that sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? So fruit flies are a really well studied organism from a genetic point of view. We talked a little bit about variants of uncertain significance in one of the earlier sessions. One of the things we're trying to do in a subset of mutations that we're fairly sure are pathogenic, but are not completely sure, so we're still calling them a voo, is actually to put them into fruit flies and see whether or not they affect their ability to move and to fly. Um, and the reason why that's a good model is that you can actually produce fruit flies relatively quickly with these mutations, so or these variants. So that's another model that we've been using quite a bit in time. So, yeah. Um, just, I'm just wondering at this time, how many FDA-approved drugs do you have under that potential therapeutics? I, I, um. <laughs> you, can, you can purchase these drug libraries. You, that's, that's, it should be possible almost to have every to, to find a library probably with every FDA approved drug. Yeah, I mean, how many are on one hundred? How many are on one hundred and sixty? Oh, we have we have that. We we, 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 we yeah, I'm, I'm patterning. Right. The, the, this is a, this is a, this is a scheme that we're going to do. Okay. Uh, I do work with a lab where we've, they've done a, done a drug screen for dystrophin deficient fish. And, and um, they tested about uh, 1,500 different drugs. And those are about 40%, maybe 50% of the FDA approved drugs. Um, so, so we would probably start with one of those libraries. They're around, each, each library is around 1,000 to maybe 500 to 1,000 drugs. Um, they're usually, well, they're FDA approved. Um, and you can, like I said, you can find other libraries that, that maybe focus on certain chemicals, by antioxidants or, or, or chemicals that, that are known to affect certain pa uh, biochemical pathways in the, in the fish. So there's lots of, lots of ways you can select a library. But most people start with libraries that are roughly around 1,000 um, FDA approved drugs, but there was a, there, but, but the, yesterday we had a talk where they, they scanned, what was it, 10,000, 100,000 different yeah, 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 it's subculture. Yeah, yeah. 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 Right, and I think just, just from one of, just from seeing this process go through for a couple other uh, muscular diseases, I think when you start with something like 1,000, you may end up with somewhere of 5 to 10 right. that are potentially efficacious, just as a percentage, just like a rough estimate, so you may start with a larger number, but there might be or 15 that have an effect, and then there may be some, some safety signals that are concerning to apply it to a wide population, and then that might go down to you know four or five compounds that would go through. Just to say that it would also, in a small community, not benefit. So I'm, I'm a child neurologist, so from a clinical perspective, it wouldn't be helpful if we ran 30 different clinical trials on 30 different medicines. So it's helpful to put them through a rigorous process to select the compound that's most likely to be successful. But you start with a large number, but it's usually a smaller number than being. If you're lucky. If, right, right. So once you get a little thing, okay. Right. Sometimes you get zero. Sure. Sometimes you get zero. Yes. And, and maybe a little light at the top. Sometimes you get nothing. Sometimes you get five. <laughs> and, I, and, I think, and, and just to be clear, when you're talking, when you're talking about uh, for dystrophin, which would be, you know, what would be affected in like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy or Beckler's muscular dystrophy, um, I think that maybe the question was for Titan specifically, are there any that have made it, you know, through step one or step two or and at this point, not, no, I, no, I, I'm not aware of any drug screens that have been done on this fish. One, one other thing, I mean, even when we start with this, <clears throat> there, there's, there's, two, there's two end results here. One is you start with these, this, these drugs, and you come up with two or three or four drugs that work, and now you've got drugs you can test 
for the next step. But also, you may be surprised at one of the drugs that come up. And you'll say, why, does this, why did this particular drug help this fish? And then you start thinking about, it, it, it stimulates your thought. And you go, you go back and you find out, oh, here's something we never thought about, a pathway we never considered. And, and now you can start maybe targeting that pathway specifically. So, so it's not only to find a drug, but also it may reveal new mechanisms that you had, that had thought of that may, may be therapeutic. You, you mentioned the COPD drug that uh, seemed to help. Yes. I'm just curious which one that was. Uh, Aminophilin. It's a, it's a PD inhibitor. And at the same time that that came out of the um, drug screen. So, so these drug screens are done in a blind manner, so the investigator doesn't know what these drugs are. So, so that, came out, that came out of the screen. And, it, and when that popped out of the screen was when the first paper started coming out that had used like sildenafil and, and some other phosphodiesterase inhibitors in mice. So, so, we, so it was kind of a good indicator that they were they, they, that, they, that they in a blinded manner found this drug that, that, that other people had kind of theorized and had shown was working for Duchenne. So it kind of validates the approach. And again, for that being for Duchenne, Duchenne, Duchenne muscular design. Yeah, that's for, that was for the Shen muscular dystrophy. There's, there's only, I I, I'm only aware of, I'm only aware of three drug screens that have been done in, in the field of, of muscle disease. So two of them were directed with against the SAP J fish, which is the dystrophin deficient fish, the models the Shen muscular dystrophy, and then the other one was done on a, a um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy 2i model. It just, it just came out about six months ago. So those are the only two. Muscle diseases, and I'm aware of that have had a, like a large scale screen. Except, I think in the science, I think in the scientific conference yesterday, um, John Dowling was talking about a, a drug screen, and also Rob. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it hasn't been published, so it's not published. That. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, work in progress. <laughs> um, but it's um, an, a, an evolving field. I think this is a really attractive, elegant way of testing a lot of drugs quickly, and we love it. Yeah, and just to follow up the two drugs you mentioned, so the NFL and the PDE inhibitor, um, our lab has tested on mice, both sildenafil and um, PD, a PDE9A inhibitor, and both of them didn't provide any conclusive help. Right, but, but certainly... Was that in the and type mice? mice? And, and, and I... I yes. Yeah, the type mice. And, and those, those screens were done um, if, if, you, if, you remember, if you remember back up where I showed you the picture of the two fish, so the way they evaluated those drugs was just to look at whether the drugs improve the, pic, the, the picture of the fish. So now this, this method here, we actually measure the function. So maybe we would pick up, uh, maybe we would reject some of these drugs that, that seem to have maybe a histological effect but really don't affect function. offshoot to these particular drug studies too using uh, fish, sometimes the negative results can be just as important because they show us pathways that are really critical to uh, the function of the, the, the protein that we're studying. So in addition to being, to being an amazing way of screening drugs for potential future therapy use, negative results are almost just as important because we might find a pathway that we can tweak in another way. Um, so I, I just thought I'd add that in. Lots of, lots of benefits of doing that kind of work. So I had a question about some research that was published out of the Grenzier lab, not to put you on the spot, but and in lab, but I don't want to shift gears and people had more questions about this topic or the zebrafish. If I can hold my question. Okay. Which was um, I thought I had seen published out of the Grenzier lab some success in with metformin and its effects for a small subtype of population variants in phosphoryl the phosphorylized section of the type. Uh -huh. Thank you. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so, just to explain, metformin is an already approved drug for the use of um, treatment of diabetes, right? Okay. So, I haven't used a Mac in a while. It feels a little weird. Do you need a mouse? <laughs> I have. 
I'm used to looking at facts all the time. No, I'm okay. <laughs> I'll just real quick say, I just want to say thank you to everybody here, all the presenters and everybody. Um, be a mom, you're changing our children's lives, so just thank you. <laughs> That's all. Ditto. And I just say in response to that, you guys make it real for us. I think sometimes it's great to see that what we're doing um, you know, benefits real people. And I think some of the, the researchers that don't often see patients, um, I think they've got a real buzz out of meeting a lot of the families. So just to let you know that. <laughs> While they're pulling up that slide, I'm going to ask another question. And Emily, I'll direct, the, uh, doctor, I'll direct this to you. This um, came up, this word comes up a lot when we talk about Titan, which is isoforms. And you talk about cardiac um, forms of Titan. And this word isoforms, if you could explain that. Yeah, we have a little oh, presentation on that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so just sim simply speaking, so uh, the Titan gene encodes the Titan protein, but that's kind of a little bit simplistic. The Titan gene actually encodes a family of Titan proteins. Um, we talk a little bit about exons. So exons are basically the building blocks of the recipe. If you like, they're different pages of the recipe. Um, there's a... Um, so the Titan family of proteins are a collection of different but somewhat similar proteins that often share many of the same recipe features, but sometimes there are differences. Sometimes there's a page that's missing, sometimes there's a page or a couple of pages that are missing, sometimes there are pages that are added in. So, And that's because Titan has to do a lot of hard work and sometimes it needs to do different work depending on how old the muscle is or where the muscle is. If you think about muscles in general, they're not all the same. They all need to do different work. Um, so that's why there are different Titan isoforms. So that the Titan cardiac isoforms are different to the Titan muscle isoforms. The muscle isoform that we know best is called N2A, so we talk a lot about N2A. But in actual fact, we think that there are a whole lot of other muscle isoforms, um, and they differ according to the age of the muscle and the type of um, the cardiac isoforms are much better characterised, and that's because the cardiac people have been working on Titan a lot longer than we have. Um, and we do know that in the cardiac coil, the mutations that impact those two biggest, longest uh, cardiac isoforms seem to be the ones that cause the most problem in terms of cardiac function and cardiac disease. So they're the more likely mutations to cause dilated cardiomyopathy in later life. So hopefully that makes sense. So Titan actually encodes a family of proteins which are called different isoforms and different, different, slightly different protein recipes. Yeah. Um, so to be fair, Sarah sent me this question in advance, so I prefer to slide to answer it. <laughs> um, but anyway, this is a cartoon of the largest possible Titan protein there is. Um, so this includes every possible exon except for one that's only present in a little short transcript. Okay, um, uh, so this would be about four megadaltons inside, really huge, really huge, okay? So anyway, we took some mice, having read about um, how uh, metformin and diabetics seem to help with uh, heart complications, we decided to test in mice what effect metformin would have. And so we took uh, wild-type mice and did a surgical procedure to basically give them um, high blood pressure, uh, which is uh, a surgical technique called transaortic constriction. And at the same time, they have a pellet of a corticosteroid, which is like something your adrenal gland secretes. And under those conditions, wild type mice develop um, um, diastolic dysfunction. Okay, And then we gave them uh, metformin in the drinking water, and it turns out it helped. Um, so mice normally, um, after having the TAC procedure, they really don't like to voluntarily exercise. So we have a running wheel that we have a little bicycle speedometer hooked up to, so we can tell how much they run throughout the day and night. And a, a wild-type mice can run miles in one night. It's amazing. Um, but anyway, uh, mice normally after the surgery don't like to run as much, but with metformin they do. And if you actually dissect out the muscles from the heart and you do mechanical studies, um, you can find out that they're not as stiff as they are if they 
if they would not had metformin. All right? And to try to track down why that was, uh, we used antibodies against specific uh, phosphoforms that are found. Uh, one is found in this N2B region and a couple sites in the PBK region. And um, it was absolutely specific to, to this region. Um, it did not change phosphorylation in this region. And a mouse that has this region deleted, when we do this, it actually, with, even without surgery, it already has uh, diastolic dysfunction, and metformin did not help it at all. all right? So we think that um, it's hard to know in advance what patients might have problems with phosphorylation right here, but um, we think it might be able to help. And at the U of A, uh, the head of our Sarver Heart Center um, is in the process of trying to get money to do a clinical trial to test metformin with our, uh, uh, cardiac patients. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? Right now? Did you try? Uh, did you see? Did you give the metformin like kind of uh, after the heart failure progression started, or did you check that? The, if you, did you see the trabeculi uh, getting? You're saying, did we look for reversal? Yes, of it? So is it a reversal or, before, yeah. or after the heart? Yeah. yeah, so after the surgery, it takes time to really develop this uh, diastolic dysfunction. So, um, and it also takes a while for the metformin to kind of have an effect. So, they did overlap. Um, it was one week after they had the surgery that they started getting metformin in the drinking water. And then it was another, I think, three weeks later that we looked at them. Um, so we did not let them develop a, like, a really bad symptoms and then try metformin because mm -hmm. things might have been too late. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, were there any other questions? Okay. Um, so Isabel and I both made some slides in preparation for questions. Um, <laughs> let me see if there's anything. Oh. Do you want me to ask a question? Do I need to set you up with a question? Oh, I'm going to give you a question. I'll stand up and ask myself. No problem. John, what is this? Um, so, uh, in this morning session, we talked a bit about um, the Titan truncating variants that can be found all across the Titan gene. And what I have plotted here is. Uh, instead of those, this is one that shows all the missense mutations. Um, so all the mutations where one amino acid has been switched with another. Okay? And they can be found kind of anywhere in the Titan gene. And I want to point out that there's like, like 33,000 amino acids there. Any one position could have... Uh, 20 something other possible amino acids in that position mm -hmm. and it's really hard to tell what effect that might have wow. all right the, every place every place up here where you don't see blue is a known domain it has a known structure mm -hmm. and we do have um, as part of the research community um, dr. Gautel had put together a website that showed every possible predicted structure based on x-ray crystallography and what the computer predicts um, the change is going to be. Is it going to be uh, no problem or is it going to cause like the, the domain to unfold? So we use that in a tool to help understand but it's, it's really hard to know what those VUSs mean when they say that they have an amino acid change. Is that tool public now? Um, yes. The website's online. I'm not sure, as a patient, if understanding what it means would help much. Like, uh, um, you know, clinical diagnostic labs, yeah. clinical diagnostic labs, they can use it. Oh, or sure. just for interpretation purposes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's available. I, I can give you the website. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's, I found the article published in the mm -hmm. it's, it's called Titan DB, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think, I think you do have access to that. And at the moment, generally, 
Um, so just talking generally about foods. We use a combination of, uh, when we have a VU, we generally don't know whether or not it's uh, definitely pathogenic. We use, I use, I don't know what other people do, I use a combination of Matias. Um, I think I've got a hotline to Matias now. We contact each other almost every day. Um, I also use a program that a colleague of mine in Sydney has developed called Intro to see whether or not a VU may affect splicing in a way that's not immediately apparent. Um, and also we're increasingly starting to use animal models like fruit flies to see whether or not that mutation is affecting muscle function in the animal model because that increases your level of suspicion that it's truly pathogenic if that's the case. Um, I would have loved to have used zebrafish actually for that work but unfortunately because uh, zebrafish have four copies of Titan it's a, a slightly tricky model for us to do that so we're resorting to resorting to it's not really an end resort um, fruit flies is not going to be an equally good model. So a combination of using computers to predict the impact um, at the protein level, as well as using animal models to see what the actual effect of that change is. And adding the patient to that. And adding a patient to that. So we're generally only looking at things that we've seen in patients. Yeah. So I, um, I have a copy, you know, of my genetic results, which has a very long mutation that identifies it. And then I see you reading this, or, you know, these visuals up here. Can you guys explain just for the people out here, like, who would have a copy of it? So mine has a C dot something. So it's, does that correlate with that? Like, so can someone break down when we get a copy of the results? We're going to be out of jobs. <laughs> <laughs> And then it's got a G bigger than an A, or whatever. Like, is there a way to simplify it for us here so when we look at these and then we read your research for kind of, without needing a degree? So, so I, I can I can have a go at that. It's a bit yeah. tricky. Um, possible. Um, so then we put a you translate all of your Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to not put us out of a job. Yeah. But it's it's, it's what our job is. It's like, this is what we're supposed to do. So in, in, in simple terms, you'll get a report. And it'll have a combination of letters and numbers, yeah. right? Um, so basically the mutation is described according to its position within the gene. Normally a report will tell you which isoform it's using to number. So you actually need to know which isoform they're using when they number the position of the mutation. Um, and in actual fact it makes no sense without having that, that information. The C dot is actually cDNA, which is kind of like RNA. So it's basically the position um, within the transcript that's made from the gene. Um, so that's the recipe for the protein. So it's the position within the isoform. The P is the protein, so P is actually uh, for protein. Um, and so that's basically uh, in the actual protein produced by that recipe where the particular change, well, it's actually what the amino acid change as a result of that uh, spelling difference is. So, and you'll see capital letters after the P. They're basically, each amino acid has its own capital letter, so that the capital letter relates to the amino acid. And it normally states the amino acid that's normally there, and the amino acid that it's been, it's been changed to as a result of the, the mutation. Um, so so that, in, that in brief is what, is what that report says, but it can be very confusing. Um, did you guys want to add anything to that? Isabel, did you want to add anything? I, I liken it to a GPS locator, so it's sort of like an address. Yeah, that's and a great it's kind of like telling you where on the street, and then those symbols and, and things are just a combination of, you know, what has that house been changed to a, an apartment or a tall story building. It's sort of where is the change and what is the change. That's a great analogy. So we have um, about 15 minutes left of this session and we want to talk about next steps and plans for Titan. So do we have any last questions for the researchers in regards to the items they talked or last comments from the speakers? I think there are many, many questions in the head of people here. And maybe you don't, uh, um, you don't understand uh, uh, all the words that we are speaking. Uh, DNA, RNA, coding, so maybe some of you don't know that. Mm -hmm. We're happy to answer those questions. So I, I know, yeah. Uh, I have prepared one thing and I wanted to, that I wanted to show before leaving this. It's just um, to highlight how it is complicated um, 
why it is complicated to study Python. I don't have it here. Yeah. So I just. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other side? Yeah. So Python is the application, and it's represented here. It's represented here, and I put here just these uh, small things here to represent uh, the, the mean size of all the other proteins uh, in the body. Um, so, so this uh, and, and this is a, a mean. So we have m much more sm smaller protein, and you can see that uh, the size is another order that we are used to work with in the lab. So this means that uh, we have the questions of the isoform, the different forms that can exist, uh, because you have here uh, a lot of possibilities uh, when you have. A protein that is coded by um, uh, four exons, you don't have much possibility. Here you have three, 363, so you can have all many different combinations. And this also uh, leads to the possibility to have many, many different interactions and many different uh, functions. And uh, in, in the lab, it's very, very difficult to manipulate uh, this protein, so we cannot have it. Uh, in a tube, uh, like we can have for the many other proteins. So this is very, uh, um, so that's why um, I think a lot of researchers are reluctant to go into Titan because they, we, we have, uh, um, there are many, you, you, you put the image of the iceberg at the beginning, but this is not the iceberg of Titan. You have just a smelted and a huge pillow because there are so many things that we don't know. Um, yeah, I put here an example, also you have titan here, and many different things that are, are known already, but there are uh, proteins that interact, at the different function, but there are many, many things that is not known. Um, and uh, because we cannot manipulate, I, we can not use directly uh, gene therapy like for the other um, proteins like um, um, we are even Duchenne is complicated already, but here we are in another uh, uh, another level uh, uh, because of the size of the protein. Um, yes, no, and I want yeah, just I wanted to show you another slide to show you the compl the difficulty regarding Titan as well. I don't look at everything. Usually, we, for gene therapy, we use uh, one virus. Uh, for the muscle, it's, it's, it is like that, represented. And usually, for any genes, we, we have only one virus. And I put here the number of viruses that will be required for titan. So it's just not it's not possible. So we need to do, to do something else. So there are different uh, additional techniques that uh, we can use for uh, trying to imagine a therapy when we want to act at the gene level. So I put two examples, which are also where the maybe this one. Um, was, the Titan one was better. Yeah. No, it's so too small. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah it's into, this is also Titan. <laughs> uh, and it represents all the different exons that exist in the protein. Okay? So they're the recipe book pages. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> they're the recipe book pages. Yeah. And that's, that's why it's a <laughs> Yeah, even us, with the, even us to, to, fight, to, to have a correlation between, to easily translate between the, uh, uh, the DNA and the protein sometimes is complicated, huh? especially because you have these different isoforms, so you have to know which isoform you are talking about. And, um, okay, so the other one was, so we have, yeah. So because we have the, all these exons, um, we have mutation in uh, the different exon. Yeah, then something I wanted to say also about the mutation is, that everybody has uh, different titan. Uh, my titan is certainly different from uh, the titan of John or of uh, 
and maybe of because we have variation in it, everybody. So this complicates a lot the um, the work of um, for the diagnosis because when you see a change, you cannot know whether it is pathogenic or just a variation because it's a normal. Everybody is different. So. Um, one technique that can be applied for titan is what we call exon skipping. So this is being applied also for Duchenne. When you have a mutation in one exon, what you do is just to use uh, a tool that will remove these exons. Um, and then you will have a shorter protein, but um, maybe with a, a conserved function. And there is another one I just wanted to show you. Um, I don't know where it is. Other one, yeah. We have a new technique also that is called gene editing, and what this technique is doing is that you cut the DNA, and um, and by cutting you can modify the DNA directly. So these two techniques, uh, even if can, we cannot apply gene therapy yet, these two techniques are um, uh, potentially uh, uh, usable for titan. What I was about to ask, and I'm not sure maybe your first of these two techniques describes that, which was if the issue, you know, let's say for some of the congenital, um, you know, Titan neuropathies in particular, where you know they've inherited one mutation from you know dad and one from mom, if one of those is more pathologic, if one of those you know causes more severe disease, is there any mechanism to selectively you know suppress that? Because I know what you're saying from the from the Gene therapy Titan is too huge to have a viral vector actually carry that into the cell. But would there be one? Would there be some way to say, oh, well, you know, if if mom's Titan is causing substantial problems because it's more pathologic, can you suppress that in the child and let the child have, you know, the other parent's Titan be more expressed, even though it's not quite normal? That perhaps gives them a milder clinical course. Uh. And does your exon stopping do that? So that's a great question. Um, I might, we're actually, so I think the concept that one mutation is more pathogenic than the other is probably a little bit misleading. So you know, I don't think we, I would generally hesitate to say that. And I think in congenital tightenopathy, both mutations are working together to cause disease. Having said that, we do know that carriers aren't weak. So if we can change one change, to produce a, a near normal titan or to actually not be expressed, then having the other one might not be quite so bad. So there is um, an argument to say um, if we could use something like the exon skipping therapy that Isabel has mentioned to treat just one of the two changes, then that probably will make the muscle weakness better. The only slightly tricky thing is when you change, because you've got two copies there that are acting together, if you skip out a particular change in one copy, it's going to be very hard not to skip out that section of the gene mm. in the other copy at the same time. So we're going to need to do some really, so treating a recessive disorder caused by two different mutations on two different genes with this sort of technology is really tricky because you've got to take into account you've got the other copy there at the same time. All these questions is also um, uh, related to the form of titanopathy. If you have a dominant form, you have usually one allele which is uh, affected, so you can remove this one or correct this one. And when you have a recessive form, if you correct one, it can be enough because it's recessive. So you, the, um, the, the better one will dominate uh, over the... Um, we already correct uh, over the, the the other. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, um, uh, all these techniques are they are tricky, like I said, and they may be. You can have some uh, some ex some sometimes a uh, situation where it's easy. You have the possibility to do it, and sometimes it, it's just impossible, mm -hmm. just because the mutation is like this in this position. It change. Uh, the possibilities that you can have to correct it. But one possibility, and this is uh, this is quite complex and probably it isn't actually happening at the moment and probably will take a bit of work to do, but is actually modifying 
the transcripts from one, one of those mutated copies of the gene at the RNA level mm -hmm. in a, using a method that identifies just that transcript, or just the transcripts from that copy of the gene, gene and not the transcripts from the other copy of the gene. It's a bit of a tricky one to get your head around. But basically, we will, we will need to tailor this. I think probably just one of the mutations will be enough. I think it will make a difference. That's my prediction. But actually, making sure that you're treating just that one copy and you're not incidentally also treating the other copy is going to be really tricky. Yeah. Yeah. And, are, and I like that you, you have seen the size. So there are many, many... A mutation, uh, a lot that will uh, be will be discovered. I'm pretty sure in the future, and this means that for for each of the mutation, you have to design your own strategy. Uh, so you can imagine the, the huge task which is uh, in front of us if we want to correct everything. And in addition, if we want to have to go to the clinical trial for each of the product, for, so for each of the mutation, this is a new product, so this should go. Um, uh, in the path of the um, therapeutic development with all the steps, the toxicity and so on, and all these steps is, mm, the cost is about, I would say, tech, uh, several millions for each of them, so uh, it's a huge, huge task. I want it. It's not that depressing because we have a lot of, we have a lot of this but you just wanted to show you that this is not simple. Wow, and it's very, there are many things to discover. It's not simple, but okay. It's challenging, but we're working hard to get there. Yeah. I know Sarah wanted to hit some of our, uh, what the goals are for the research community. So I um, just wanted to thank you all for your input, and I wanted to uh, reiterate that Titan is amp absolutely aptly named. <laughs> we have a giant here, and trying to Unveil and understand it is, is really a, a, going to take time. Sarah, would you help? Would you mind helping pull up my oh, yeah. slides and say I think it says Titan Goals? And thank you. And then because I wanted not um, let's put it this way. I think that one time in New York, they thought the biggest problem in New York was going to be the city would be just taken over and overrun with manure. It was the biggest probably problem facing the city in the future, but. Obviously, that's not the case today because we have automobiles. Meaning, yes, this is complicated, and yes, it seems like the greatest, biggest problem we have right now. But I'm optimistic and hopeful that with the continued discoveries and hard works with experts like this, that we'll, we'll continue to um, unveil answers. And that's why we're all here. And it's so important that we, because when you're in a small community, every single person that participates is really important. Especially when you look at scientific studies, when they have to meet a certain statistical criteria to make it meaningful, so that it, just that every single person in this room today is, is really important that you're here. So I just wanted to talk about some um, research goals and next steps, and you guys can feel free to chime in. And um, Dr. Oates has been kind enough to do a webinar for our community in the past that you can find on. YouTube and listen to it, and she outlines her goals and focus uh, research focus on, on that webinar, which she doesn't want to listen to right now. <laughs> but she has her slides. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really it's a great resource, and you know sometimes you could almost li like listen to it. Maybe not you, but we listen to it over and over again because there's always something more to learn. But just um, so as far as research, our goals for Team Titan for things that we want to accomplish moving forward, this diagnosis issue, and that was something we talked about this morning. Moving, um, improving the diagnostic pipeline for families, including functional analysis of the U.S., um, getting a clinical determination, because I know it's really important to all of you and your families. And we have, um, um, one of our goals is to work on an ICD code, which is a medical diagnostic code that's really Im important for certain areas for tracking, monitoring um, diseases over time. And that is a project that we're working for on. We had a, a meeting um, with the uh, CDC to start initiating that kind of conversation so that when you go to the doctors, they could actually in electronic medical records track people with this diagnosis because otherwise we get put into another umbrella. So that's something we're working towards. And um, a lot of the, I know Dr. McNally touched on this, which is it's one thing to work for a treatment for tomorrow, but guess what? We're living today with this disease every day. And so it's important to have what is best care practice? What are the best things that I can do to stay healthy for my family? And so we're working to, um, I'm going to be 
considering working on specifically for cardiac, what is best practice for people that um, have one or two copies of variants of Titan, but also their extended family members and what it means for them and best monitoring and treatment for that. But also we have, I just want to remind everyone that we do have a care guide for people with the congenital myopathies and also the congenital muscular dystrophies. And that is available not only as a, a medical document that you could hand to your doctor if they don't understand, but the other thing is that you could, um, it's available on Amazon. It has been translated into a guide for families that we, we spend a lot of time working on to try to make it more um, accessible and understandable to families that a lot of parents and affected individuals put input as well as physicians and clinicians to make that guide. And we're going to be breaking in a minute. Okay. Okay. And um, let's see. And then research goals, which tomorrow we're going to have some time to talk about clinical aspects, and Emily can have more time tomorrow to take um, to talk about maybe some of her goals and clinic clinical um, things. But um, just developing cardiac care best practice, basic science research, which is what they're doing, understanding like the Titan at the molecule and all the work that you're doing here today, and then expanding genotype phenotype understanding of tight related muscle and heart disorders. So there's more to, more to go. Oh, and this is my goal for us, guys, and that is connecting and supporting families and um, getting more families connected to each other, getting into our database, making sure you get some kind of basic information and access to how do I learn more, and that's great that you're here because that's all part of this, and making sure that you're staying up to date and um, access to the best information. And also, so we can get you enrolled in research. And um, this was something that someone else had uh, I took, I asked of families for input, and this was one thing that somebody said that uh, specific to teens and young adults, different approaches for that for pe young people, and maybe having um, transitioning to adulthood and stuff. And there's going to be sessions on that tomorrow, so I invite you, if that's one of your issues, to, to focus on it. Actually, Adam Boy and Patrick Boy are speaking on some good tips tomorrow in their life hacks talk. And, oh, um, Dr. McNally was talking about, oh, don't worry, I'm going to connect you with a good cardiologist who can get your the correct assessment. And we're going to be working on building this, so I could use some help, which is a list of doctors and practitioners around the country and the world with good understanding of titanopathies because, you know, um, like uh, Dr. Bag said yesterday, not all doctors, just, there's no possible way you could understand and know every rare disease. It's just not humanly possible for one doctor. So to have a resource of doctors and um, also have a list of researchers and research opportunities for people to participate in. So like a repository hub for that kind of stuff. So um, and we're really running um, short on time. So. They actually take the snacks away when it's time to end the break. So I don't want you guys to miss out. So, but just I think I'm afraid they come and they go. So I want to make sure you get your break. But um, also, we t somebody had suggested this, which was resources for letters of medical necessity for families and clinicians um, and instruction sheets. That's something um, Dr. Oates and I were talking about fact sheets to, uh, that you can share with doctors and have a good understanding of your. Um, condition in a fast, easy, understandable way, and so those are all things. And we can talk more about this over the weekend, online, continuing discussions, questions, and, tom and tomorrow's care session. So I think that's it. Oh, no, there's more. Let's see. But some of these things are um, things that are, they're going to be talking about tomorrow. Just how do you, uh, we were talking about this too, raising awareness, educating medical students, and training people in neuromuscular disease. And that's all kind of related to awareness, these issues. And that's it. So everyone, thank I know it got hot in here. I'm pretty sorry. <laughs> Let's go. We can enjoy your time. Thank you.